Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the third session of the first block of the online day of the 2023 Web Archiving Conference. Uh, the title of this session is Researching Web Archives, and we are going to uh, go deeper into Web Archives to see what kind of questions and answers uh, we can only find in Web Archives and what challenges um, lie ahead. And with that, let me introduce our panelists. So we have uh, Tim Riberic and uh, Sam Langdon from the Digital Scholarship um, at Brock University who are presenting AOY, All Our Yesterdays, a toolkit to explore web archives in CoLab. And um, then I would also like to introduce Matt Kelly from the College of Computing and Informatics at Drexel University, who has been using web archives to model academic migration and identify brain drain. So um, since we have all watched the videos beforehand, uh, I'm going to ask our panelists to um, give a short introduction into their presentations, uh, starting with uh, Tim and Sam, please. Okay, super. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so our presentation is about uh, a toolkit that we've developed uh, that allows us to um, help novice researchers use and explore web archives. And I hope the video demonstrated some of the components that it had. Uh, we actually got on a grant project to investigate local uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis communication. So that's a, a study from, uh, it's, a, a it's a discipline in communications that looks at how information is communicated from authorities to people. And uh, we were able to work with a research team that had a lot of questions about how to get information out of web archives. And so we took all those lessons that we learned and we tried to bundle everything up into a uh, platform that novice researchers that don't have a lot of experience with works could use. And uh, we built that on top of the ARC toolkit that's part of the Archivit uh, platform, as well as the Google Colab environment, because uh, I really enjoy notebooks and I think they're very useful for novice um, uh, researchers. And so, our, yeah, and that's what led us to this point. So now we're at a spot where we have a little bit of a beta that actually works. And so now we're looking for uh, other research teams that might want to use that or help us guide development of it. And uh, yeah, I don't know, Sam, if you want to add anything else, but I, I think that covers it. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good summary of where it's at right now. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, what I liked about the demo you showed in the video is really this step-by-step -step approach with just a few clicks you can move along. and. You don't seem to be overwhelmed with too many options and uh, by the, the, the outcome also of um, uh, your queries. Okay, uh, then uh, moving on to Matt, please, would you give a short introduction to your presentation? Please? Sure, yeah. So um, uh, my presentation was about a project, an NSF-funded NSF, uh, project where we're trying to utilize web archives to track academic migration of faculty at historically black colleges and universities in the United States. And to the point here, we'd be acting, we'd be um, interfacing with web archives from sort of the end user perspective. And um, this was a little bit problematic because trying to look at um, historical HBCUs, the location of where this faculty actually was listed in the past has changed over time. And so part of this required us not just to go to the academic uh, department's websites, but rather trying to figure out exactly where they were. So by utilizing the web archives, um, we first had to go to the, um, the university's home pages and then track them to the department web pages and then track down the faculty web pages and then then we could actually get our payload but even that was problematic because even some of the universities had changed uh locations over time changed urls and so this is really an effort a part of an effort a side effect of it was um this notion of what we'd call quasi-canonicalization we're trying to associate different urls or different web pages that existed at different urls that, uh, at the same time that uh, or essentially contain the same content. So we've seen this elsewhere in other realms, for example, the Facebook and Facebook and the various uh, Sun microsystems uh, had the Java web page at one point, where it's Oracle when they bought them out, that same, same sort of concept. The idea here was ultimately we want to be able to not just um, identify where the faculty was, but also uh, to develop a methodological approach to be able to use this in other domains beyond just um, identifying faculty. So. Um, this uh, presentation was about um, sort of describing our um, progress so far in doing so. And we've been able to effectively use uh, web archives as sort of the first step to identify the faculty at the different universities in the past 
And our, our ultimate goal is to track um, academic migration. We do have some data points in there. And so we're taking this data that we're getting from the various web archives and we're um, dovetailing it with a couple other data sets that are a little more curated, but not nearly as complete. So sort of one facet of the web archives and the manual collection process is it's, um, uh, it, it's relatively thorough. I wouldn't say comprehensive, but it's much more, contains much more data, uh, both noise and signal that we need uh, when trying to identify the faculty. So we look at like the curated data sets and they like, they contain maybe three departments at a web of a universities in the past, whereas it, in fact, the um, university had like 20 departments or something like that. But, you know, so there's just sort of balance. So we've definitely found, found value in using web archives and we're using um, a, a memento aggregator to get uh, these different pages in the past. We found that are mostly prevalent, them being the, um, the US universities um, for, for the inner archive, which was sort of a, unfortunate side effect, but that's definitely what we're, um, we've, we've found. So um, yeah, this presentation was mostly just uh, describing sort of our project, our progress on this project so far. All right, thank you, Matt. Uh, I think your presentation really illustrates really well uh, how quickly the amount of, of data you want to work with grows exponentially while progressing in your research and also the the gaps that you encounter become uh, 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 more and more apparent. So I'm um, going to move to a question that I'm um, going to put to both um, both presentations. Um, have actually talked about the complexity of working with WAC files and how quickly the amount of uh, data to be handled can be overwhelming. Maybe if we uh, imagine looking five or ten years into the future, what changes would you like to see happen or what areas do you think have to improve uh, um, uh, to improve the accessibility for web archives uh, for researchers? And maybe Matt if you uh, Matt if you want to uh, start me. Sure yeah so I can I can speak of some of the recent innovations. I think the web uh, work files in particular have become much more accessible in probably the last five to ten years and looking forward I hope that um, continues further. I know particularly with the um, the web recorder package and trying to do data science on works has become so much easier with the work IO library. And so I have um, students working with works, whereas in the past, um, they can only really um, use the works from a replay perspective. So I'd, um, I'm anticipating the tooling will get a little bit better while at the same time you want to abstract it where the web archives can be used for research purposes without having to work with works by the same time for those that want to do the sort of analysis that requires you to work with the works, the tooling will hopefully ideally improve a little more. Tim and Sam, would you like to, to add to that? Yeah, of course. Um, I think what's really great, and I encourage everyone to check it out if, if they haven't already, is the ARC uh, platform that's built into the Archivit tool that creates uh, um, CSV file derivatives of work files. So if you, know, you hand someone over a, a four gigabyte, you know, zip file effectively, you know, as a novice researcher or someone that's not familiar with uh, you know, how these things work or operate, you know, that's very overwhelming. But if you go to this web interface, click through, click through, and you get a nice CSV file that then you can take to whatever platform you're comfortable with, like R or Python or a notebook, or even just like Excel, if you really wanted to, I think that's going to go a long way. Uh, but part and parcel of that is like the training and the teaching to make sure that people understand the way those steps work. So we have all our web pages, we crawl them, we create works, and then we can create CSV files developing that pipeline and getting really uh, good about describing those steps, I think will be the challenge. But I mean, once people figure that out, um, you know, it'll be uh, a lot easier to work with the output of works as opposed to just the works themselves. I see. Thank you. Um, I completely forgot to mention that, uh, of course, uh, um, all the attendees are uh, encouraged to um, ask their questions in the Q&A tab. And you can uh, use the CC icon to turn on automatic uh, captions. Um, uh, uh, Tim, you just mentioned uh, documenting and uh, uh, describing the steps. Um, we often talk about the importance of documentation uh, in also in order to better understand the, the gaps and uh, obstacles in, encountered uh, while archiving the web. In what ways could web archives also improve their documentation and collection policies in order to make uh, researchers more aware of, of possible limitations? Yeah, that's a great question. The What I immediately come back to is like, um, we use ARC, ARC of it. Uh, to sort of build our collections. And I think um, the best way to sort of tell researchers what's in them is to bolster that display or maybe have the metadata associated with those presentations of archives a little bit more 
uh, full fledged and and uh, built up a touch so that you kind of have an idea of like I've, I think I think one of the the challenges and certainly what we came across during the preliminary stages of this is that we had a faculty member whose expertise was in communications and said, "Can I ask this question of this data?" And then we'd have to deploy our RAs to sort of devise some scripts and notebooks that could make that happen. So I th it is certainly a challenge, and that's the million dollar question. But I, I think that that metadata maybe we need to. Uh, create a schema or a layer that describes sort of what's possible with the data as opposed to just what the data is about. Uh, it's kind of very, you know, self-referential, but I, I know it's a challenging question. It's something, you know, that'll keep us all employed for the rest of our careers. That's for sure. Thank you. Uh, I already have a, a question in the chat. Uh, to Matt, you mentioned uh, quasi-canonical, it's a difficult word, canonicalization. Maybe. Uh, please, could you talk a little more about what this means and how you used it to tidy your data and also how to pronounce it correctly, please? Sure, yeah. So this notion of a canonicalization is the idea of being able to associate different URLs together in the past. So essentially the www.example.com and the example.com together, including the index.html page, all these um, different URLs that would signify the same web page. And so that is conventional canonicalization as using web archives and most replay systems and indexing systems use this. Um, and so what we are finding, and this has kind of been, um, you know, e existed, just not, I don't think necessarily uh, identified as this concept of quasi canonicalization where in fact the same web page has existed at different um, locations in time. So I gave the example, I think, in the presentation of the Java web page, but we also are finding this for, with, for example, um, one of the HBCUs we're looking at is um, Howard University, for instance, if Howard existed at Howard.edu and then like www.howard.edu at the same time, perhaps it's the same thing. Um, and if you go deeper down into, for example, a faculty page that existed at different points in time, when in fact it's the same web page, just happened to move domains, then that is a, a, an instance of what we're calling a quasi canonicalization here. And this is useful for um, exploration when you know the same sort of um, expectation of data is going to be there over time to a certain point until it drastically changes and perhaps URL changes. So, um, yeah, that's what I mean by quasi canonicalization there. And so this is used in our research for being able to identify. Uh, for instance, the different faculty pages that existed at different locations in time when in fact they're the same web page. So it's rather being able to have what, what we're trying to facilitate is having some um, secondary identifier to associate these different URLs together rather than having using the basis of the URL as the key. And I think this is a powerful notion because if you can um, do that across different web archives or within one ar web, ar web archive saying a, a web page existed at drastically different locations, then in fact, you're able to get a more representative picture of a page in the past rather than relying the, on the URL as the key. And so it's one of sort of this balance that we're trying to strike here. And I think it was exhibited, at least its usefulness in um, this project that we're working on. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Um, I have another question to Tim and Sam. Uh, you mentioned in the presentation that the uh, next step is a complete base set of um, analysis notebooks. Can you give a, a few examples of uh, what is missing now from the toolkit and what you are working on at the moment? Sam, do you want to just mention the, the notebooks you're currently working on? Yeah, so uh, right now we have sort of some that are based in kind of collection analysis and also like text analysis, but we're hoping to um, work on some like graph analysis based notebooks so you can kind of look at how different web pages are uh, connected together and kind of how like the network structure of your archive works. Um, so we're hoping to look into that and then I think we were also uh, once once that's sort of completed, the last one, the last kind of big category we wanted to work on was uh, there's another type of derivative you can generate uh, in the ARC tool uh, that is for different file types that you have. So if you want to do analysis of like what kinds of files are present in your archive, that's another one that we wanted to uh, work on at some point in the future. Yeah, um, the ARC platform has, I think, five categories of derivatives that it generates for you, and we want to make sure we have a, a few notebooks that explore that data for each of those five categories. So we spent a lot of time on text analysis, and Sam has done a bang up job making a, a word cloud generator because we, from our feedback, you know, that's what drives the process a lot. People love to see that, and it's very visual, and you know, like it conveys a lot of information. So we spent a good time on on word clouds and sort of the preliminary text analysis. We want to build into the the sort of more nitty gritty, so that you know 
for example, we had LDA uh, topic modeling as a thing. I'm sure a lot of novice researchers have no idea what that what that is. So I think we need a couple of notebooks to get us between <laughs> word cloud and you know topic model. And uh, we are working with another research team that has a grant to explore the toolkit and how it works. So we're going to do some A-B testing, user feedback to see if we can sort of build those steps in and see what's missing. So maybe next year, who knows, we'll talk about uh, how that happened. But yeah, that's work currently underway. And, uh, you also mentioned that uh, you're looking for uh, collaborators for uh, testing. Uh, what do people need to um, need to take part in the testing in terms of uh, skills and and, and the hardware, software, what, what do we need to bring uh, to, to, uh, to help out? Yeah, awesome question. Um, I think what we came up with a bunch of questions during our first research um, uh, grant project uh, to write a paper for that communications professor. Now we're at a spot where, well, like, what other questions does a researcher ask out of a web archive? that a notebook would be able to generate and solve for them. So we, both of us come from a more technical tradition. We're good at writing code and applying algorithms to stuff, but we don't know what a historian or a, a, you know, a community health researcher would need. So basically, you know, the only criteria or the thing we're asking is if someone has access to an archive and they have some questions about it and they don't know how to connect those two pieces, you know, we'd love to partner with them just to see how viable it is. The university down the road from us has gotten in contact and we're kind of having a chit chat about what's possible. But yeah, certainly that's that's where we're at because we can keep making notebooks that do interesting, weird, uh, you know, algorithms on text or, you know, generate all the word clouds we want. But if that doesn't help actual frontline researchers generate their thesis or write journal articles, you know, like we need that um, tie in with a, with a, a research team that has that need but not maybe the expertise to accomplish it and uh, i see already with uh, michelle you have a, a new uh, collaborator who, who will be in touch about the toolkit and who also has two questions uh, what is the boilerplate removal tool library uh, uh, used for and uh, can the toolkit operate on WAXZ files as well well um sam i don't know you I'll, I'll let you try it first, unless you want me to try an answer, because you're, uh, you're the, the boilerplate removal tool. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what the library is called off the top of my head. Um, a lot of the, uh, for the derivative generation notebook, which we talked about in the presentation, um, that's built off of another really great toolkit called the Archives Unleashed Toolkit, which is like a command line based tool. Um, and so they have, they use a boilerplate removal library in their tool. Um, so we didn't directly implement that. It's, it's based off of that tool. Um, so I'm not entirely sure what the, what that library is off the top of my head. Um, I'm not familiar with WAXZ files, but that's certainly, now that we know that this is a thing of interest, this is kind of really what we're looking yeah. for is like for people who are working with data to tell us like, here's what I'm interested in, or here's what I need to support um, so that we can kind of look into seeing if we can support those things. Um, so we don't currently support WAXZ files, but maybe we could. All right, great. Thank you, Sam. And I have another question for Matt. Uh, are there any plans to present the, uh, again, quasi canon canonicalization of URLs, uh, which I think think is like creating a family tree for the content of the web pages in a network graph or any other form of researchers? Um, well, I think uh, the process of being able to identify this, um, this phenomena of quasi colonization is, is useful beyond our, our use case here. And so I, I think the contribution there and it's sort of a side contribution to the project is the methodology of being able to identify them as having sufficient similarity to indicate quasi-canonization. So while we can publish um, them in the scope of our project, um, I'm not sure it would necessarily be as useful. And while we, we still intend on doing that for the sake of um, you know, uh, uh, transparency of the outputs, um, I think the contribution will be the ultimate methodology that we, we publish on and give some examples of where this might be exhibited elsewhere. And perhaps this method may be useful for others and other, do other domains to be able to 
um, utilized to be able to get that same approach. Because if you can identify the same web page in a large corpus as being this one and the same, um, then you can say, okay, well, this is filling in the temporal gaps that previously we didn't realize there was data that was, um, you know, sufficient um, in the timeline of a page in the past. Yeah, thank you. I have an, another question for you, Matt. Um, do you think that there, there's also steps that uh, universities and other institutions um, uh, could undertake to have better quality and more complete captures of their websites, maybe like the website structure or the way they uh, handle migrations to new website, the website updates? Uh, is that maybe something that uh, that should be promoted as well? Yeah, I think sort of inherent in our target, and this has evolved a little bit over time, is that a lot of the web pages for academic sites are relatively simple compared to some of the other ones. So, for example, they will have a lot of dynamic JavaScript. A lot of them will have mm -hmm. uh, a hierarchy that is very similar to the or uh, very familiar to those that have you know, visited an academic website before. So, um, our uh, our problem really was being able to identify exactly where the um, faculty listing was, and there was a little bit of variance in that from university to university, as understandably um, so. Um, and so I think that is actually um, for our benefit and uh, sort of encouraging academic websites to continue to be accessible in this way um, is allowing us to do the sort of exploration we are. Now, we can't expect that same sort of thing from industry websites or anyone that's trying to take advantage of modern technologies, of course, but at the same time for, the, for um, researching the um, academia, I think it's useful to say that um, because of the site structure, we're able to access the data a little easier. We're a different domain than perhaps it would be a bit more difficult. Yeah, yeah. I think it's maybe wishful thinking to think, okay, we can maybe just um, e e explain what, what websites should look like and then everyone will uh, uh, try to incorporate it in, in, in the way they, um, they uh, present their content in the future. But, but in Luxembourg, for example, we recently had an example of an institution who noticed that uh, in past captures there were some, um, there was some content missing and they said, okay, we are moving on to a new uh, website. Maybe we should have a meeting with the web archive to see how, how this could improve in the future. So uh, maybe, yeah, maybe that's also a, a, a something that will then later on uh, really, really help uh, researchers who, who are looking at those captures. Uh, I would like to thank our speakers, our panelists. Uh, yeah, thank you again for everyone uh, and uh, great presentations.